Please be seated as I pray. God, what a great gift Christ is, Lord, and that we stand here worshiping you because of his death on the cross, Lord, how grateful we are. As we begin this time of communion, Lord, just um, help my words to be clear, Lord, help hearts to be open and help your gospel to be spoken true in your name, amen. Thanks for being here today. Um, I love worshiping together on these Sunday mornings. Um, and right now we're going to open our Bibles and worship together um, as we take communion. Uh, we'll be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you don't have a Bible, there are men here in the front that would love to put one in your hands. Um, go ahead and raise your hand and they'll hand one to you. And if you need that Bible, um, go ahead and keep it. It's our gift to you. Before we read from 1 Peter, let me give you a little background on why I want to talk about these verses. Uh, my small group is about to study this book. So as I've been preparing for our study, I've been reading the book as many times as I could. Um, sometimes that meant several times in a day. Sometimes it meant listening to it over and over again on my ride to work, taking a break during lunch, reading through it. And every time I read through it, one verse stood out to me. And that verse is 1 Peter 1.15. Let's read it together very quick. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Like the Holy One, be holy. How? In all behavior. Not some behavior, all. Now reading that verse outside of the context leaves some stuff out. So I want to take us back and fly over chapter 1. I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I want to point some highlights out from it to you. Look at your Bibles briefly as we walk through this chapter together. Verses 1 through 5 give us some background. Peter wrote this book to Christians, or as he calls them, aliens, to remind them that earth is not their home. He gives, them, gives such a great summary of the purpose of the gospel in saving sinners. He calls the audience chosen according to God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus and be sprinkled with his blood. That is such a sweet view of our triune God. And then as we jump down to verse 6, we see in 6 through 9 that he talks about how a Christian that is saved by grace through the blood of Jesus should walk in trials. Trials draw you to worship. Isn't 6b and 7 sweet? And this week, as we meditate on what Jacob shared with us last week, it's so good to know that trials result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. Trials are sweeter when we worship God in them. And now we're getting close to the section I want to meditate on this morning. Verses 10 through 12 are our last step to our passage. So let's read them together. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. How many of you pause when you see the phrase, things into which angels long to look? I'll tell you what, when I read that phrase, I go back and try to figure out what's really happening, because if it catches angels' attention, it better catch mine. So let's look together. When Peter references things which now have been announced to you, he is specifically referring to the gospel. He is saying that people preached the gospel to you. He is saying that the fact that Jesus came to the earth to live in a, a perfect life and then died and was resurrection, resurrected, the punishment he took on the cross was a substitute for the punishment that you deserve for your sins. That's the gospel. It says that if you put your faith in Jesus and his death on the cross, you will be saved from your sins. This gospel was preached to you, and this gospel is captivating. Not just captivating to hear, not just captivating to the media audience of the gospel, but angels. Yes, angels watch these men preach the gospel and cannot wait to see sinners saved by the preaching of the word from sinners. They love watching God get glorified in this way. Praise God that we get to participate in this. 
And now we get to our section. Look at verse 13 with me. Therefore, since the gospel is preached and people's lives are changed by it, angels love watching this. We as Christians have something we need to do. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at, salvation, at the salvation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I titled this message in my notes, Resetting Our Standard for Holiness. What is your standard for holiness or righteous living? How do you judge yourself? Do you look at your non-believing co-workers and think, I need to swear less, complain less, be less of a liar, show less anger than that person? And then the co-workers will see Christ in me. Maybe you interact with your small group leader and see his example and strive for that. Maybe you have a Christian parent and that is a solid example and you fight to live up to the that person's example of holiness. Maybe an elder is your example and role model for holiness. Maybe it's your favorite apostle. Maybe a theolo theologian. Um, there are standards that we can look at out there that are good and drive us in a good direction, but they are not the standard that God has called us to. They're not even close. Peter says, like God the Father who called you, be holy in all behavior. Holy means to be set apart. Remember from verse 1 that we're aliens here. Saved by grace, and we are commanded to be set apart in every way that we live, in every behavior. Earthly models are not good enough. They fall short. We need to stretch ourselves far beyond what anyone in this room will stretch us. So how do we do this? This passage gives us a clue. In verse 14, it says, to not be conformed to our former lusts. So what should we be conformed to? If we're to be holy like God is holy, we need to conform our behavior to the character of God. The commentator describes it like this. Peter's command in 115 that his Christian readers be holy was a call to live in obedient relationship to Christ that by definition would set them apart from the pagan society. The Christian's morality would be defined by and derived from the character of God, their father, as first revealed in scripture and then ultimately in the life of Christ. Our standard for holiness should never look horizontally, but should always look vertically. We cannot be tempted to see what others strive what others do and strive for, and for their level of holiness. We need to live a life completely set apart. We are asked each week when we take communion to remember Jesus and examine ourselves. Personally, I always think through my week in the areas of sin, and for lack of a better word, the areas of sin that haunt me. When those come to mind, I confess those sins to God and ask him to forgive me and ask him to help me repent of those sins. I strive to change and to show a marked difference in those areas. Today, as we remember that Jesus is our standard for holiness, I want you to think beyond the haunting sins. Look at your life, look at every aspect of it, and ask God to be near so that you can emulate his character and be holy in all behavior. If you're here this morning, but you are one that doesn't put your faith in Jesus to save you from your sins, I want to speak to you for a minute. I want you to go back to verse 12. Jesus came to the earth to save sinners. This act of love and mercy is so amazing that there are beings in heaven watching it like it's the best entertainment in all eternity. They see a life that is dead in his transgressions and sin, destined for all an eternity of wrath, saved by a God who sent his son to die, and they could watch that happen to you. God asks that you trust Jesus with your life, and he'll save you. I want to beg you this morning to put your faith in him. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He went to the cross to bear the punishment for your sins. Regardless of what those sins are, he asks that you believe in him for eternal life. Put your faith in him, and he will forgive those sins. And he does. You can do that right now. However, if you not, do not, please let the cup and bread pass. It's time for communion is a time of worship reserved for those who put their trust in Jesus. If you have any questions, please see me one of the elders or the person that brought you, we'd love to talk to you about our Savior. Men, can you please serve us? And as they do, take communion on your own this morning.